Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I've been following the food chain, and this has been my work for a dozen years. This is, uh, I wrote Omnivore's Dilemma, which was my first book totally dedicated to food. And that really looked at agriculture and how we bring food out of the earth. And it focused on farming to a large extent. And after I did that, and that was, it's a book really about where your food comes from, which is something that in modern life, we've lost track of. This story of where our food comes from, 75 years ago, you could not you could not sell a book about that because everybody knew where their food comes from. They, they were directly involved with the agriculture or they knew somebody who was and they'd been on farms. And um, so I've been very fortunate in that there's now this job description where you tell people what once everybody knew um, and get paid to do it. And then I leapt ahead because readers were asking me a lot of questions about health. So I, I started looking at the other end, the far other end of the food chain, which is to say what happens to our bodies when we ingest this stuff. What do we know about the links between diet and health? Which is a very vexed subject. And I spent a lot of time exploring nutrition science, trying to get, come up with some answers. And that resulted in uh, a book called In Defense of Food and another one, a small uh, book of food rules, as it's called, an eater's manual. But along the way, I kept getting these powerful hints that the middle link of the food chain the one where the stuff coming off the farms is transformed into meals was perhaps the most influential. And this was surprising to me because it seemed the one that was most obvious. You know, cooking or food processing, as we call it when corporations do it. Um, but I came to see that the kind of agriculture we have is very much a function of the kind of cooking we're doing. So that if you're letting fast food companies cook your food, you're going to have vast monocultures of corn and soya and, uh, and animals in feedlots. And, and the reason is that fast food companies and other food processors um, drive down the cost of food relentlessly and force economies of scale and efficiencies, or what are called efficiencies, on farming. And I'll just give you one example. Um, if you go to McDonald's, anywhere in the world, you will find uh, French fries or chips, as you call them. And you will find that they're always made from the same potato, the russet Burbank potato. This is a potato from America that's unusually long and, um, and difficult to grow. And, but that's what they want, because uh, when, when, you're making, when you're McDonald's, you like those red boxes with a little bouquet of very long chips. Uh, it looks really good. And so they insist that all their potatoes be russet Burbanks. And they further insist that they have no blemishes at all. There's a very common defect of, of russet Burbank potatoes called net necrosis. And you've seen potatoes with a little brown line sometimes or spots that come through it. Well, McDonald's won't buy them if, you, if your potatoes have that. And the only way to eliminate that is to eliminate an aphid. And the only way to do that is with a pesticide called Monitor that is so toxic that the farmers who grow these potatoes in Idaho uh, won't venture outside into their fields for five days after they spray. Uh, and then when they harvest their potatoes, they, they have to put them in these atmosphere-controlled sheds the size of a football stadium uh, because they're not edible for six weeks. They have to off-gas all the chemicals in them. So you see the desire for a certain kind of chip leads to a certain kind of agriculture. But the other thing on the health side, when I started learning about nutrition, about which, by the way, much less is known than you might think, um, that the scientific understanding of nutrition is still very primitive. Um, but I learned that what mattered most about one's health was not necessarily the nutrients, good or bad, that you were consuming or, or staying away from, or even the calorie counts. But what, what, what predicted a healthy diet more than anything else is the fact that it was being cooked by a human being and not a corporation. Corporations cook very differently than people do. They use vast amounts of salt, fat, and sugar much more than you would ever use in your own cooking. And the reason they do that is those are three incredibly attractive and incredibly cheap ingredients. And when they're layered properly, as in a, um, uh, a chip, 
or um, you know, various uh, pastries and, and, and forms of junk food, they're incredibly addictive. And in fact, people in the industry, they don't, they don't talk about addiction uh, in the food industry, even though they traffic in addiction. They talk about craveability. It's the same thing. Um, and snackability is another term they use. Um, it's a lovely word. Um, anyway, so I, I came to see that cooking has a huge bearing on our health. And in fact, there's been a lot of research in America that shows that even poor women who cook have healthier diets than wealthy women who don't. So you see the usual class bias in the quality of diet is, over, is overtaken by this fact, this key fact. Who's cooking your food? I basically developed this appreciation for how important these transformations are in the middle of the food system. Uh, and the middle link of the food chain deserved a book of its own. And that's what got me started on this book. That and the fact that home cooking is in free fall. It's been declining since the mid-60s as processed food has become more prominent and as fast food has, has really taken over our diets. And in America, uh, I don't have the numbers for Great Britain, although I, I'm told they're quite similar, rates of home cooking have fallen by half since the mid-60s. In America today, we spend 27 minutes on cooking per average uh, and four minutes cleaning up. Now, that four minute should tell you something. I mean, what kind of cleaning up can you do in four minutes? You can crumple a pizza box and scrape some plates, but you're probably not tackling a pot. What it suggests is even that definition of cooking may be rather diluted. And it is no coincidence, and in fact, the link has been pretty well demonstrated, that as rates of home cooking decline, rates of obesity go up. And if you look around the world, the countries where home cooking is still healthy, that tradition, that practice, have lower rates of obesity. So I set out to write a book about cooking, but the way I'm describing it, you, you might think it's a policy book or an argument, um, and it actually isn't. It's, I mean, there's an implicit argument in it, but it's really a, a story of my education, learning how to cook. Um, and I decided that the best way to encourage people to cook was to remind them what a beautiful, miraculous work it is, practice it is, and that we have been I would argue almost brainwashed to think of cooking as drudgery, um, something we don't have time for, or something we don't have the skills for. We fetishize cooking in our society today. We all watch television shows about these heroic athletic chefs who can do these amazing feats while the clock is ticking down behind them. It looks terrifying. It looks like work best left to professionals. And restaurant cooking has kind of become what we think of as cooking. But of course, that's never been the case. Restaurant cooking is a very special, specialized activity. And that's not the bar. We're being daunted about cooking. And then you have the industry with marketing messages that are flattering our sense of busyness and, 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 and implicitly telling us, you don't have time to cook. You're too important. You're a loser if you have time to cook. <laughs> And that's, you know, this is traditionally how marketing works. You create an anxiety, and then you create a solution. So I do tell the story of how we came to this uh, in the United States and how a culture of home cooking was dismantled, deliberately dismantled by the food industry. They wanted very much to insinuate themselves into our homes, into our families. And they have been doing this, or trying to do it, for more than 100 years. And then something interesting happens post-World War II. During World War II, the food industry worked with the government to come up with some amazing innovations to feed the troops, basically. Uh, they learned how to freeze dry food and make instant coffee and make powdered orange juice and to, uh, to simulate all kinds of foods and make them shelf stable. And after the war, they had all this wonderful technology that they wanted to sell to us. And they worked very hard. They redoubled their efforts to sell us processed food. Um, and uh, they were resisted for a long time. Uh, a lot of, uh, when they marketed to women, who were doing most of the cooking, of course, uh, women would say, well, of all the housework, you know, cooking is actually the part I like best. It's my creative outlet. Um, if, you, if someone can help with the ironing, great. Um, but they kept at it. And their opening really came in the 60s and 70s when women went to work in large numbers and uh, the feminist uh, revolution took place. 
And what happened was very interesting there. Um, and, this, and this could be easily misinterpreted, and it has been by some people, as blaming feminism for the collapse of home cooking. That's actually not what happened at all. What happened is that when feminism uh, arrived on the scene there, and women were working, there was a very awkward conversation that unfolded on kitchen tables all over the West, which was, we need to renegotiate the division of labor in the home. And the food industry saw this wonderful opportunity. And they said, in effect, through their advertising, stop arguing. We've got you covered. We'll do it for you. We'll do the cooking. And the, the metaphor of this campaign, which took place in many, many companies over many years, was a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, which took out billboards in the early 70s across America with a giant bucket of fried chicken, you know, the red thing with the 14 pieces of chicken popping out of the top, and just a two-word slogan, women's liberation. It's very, very clever. Because they redefined not cooking which was kind of in disrepute before this, as the progressive thing to do, and, uh, and, and forward-looking, and that we, would, we should industrialize our cooking, take it, off the, take it off the table at home. And men grabbed at this, and women grabbed at this, because it essentially solved a problem. Once again, create an anxiety, solve a problem. Um, and that is, uh, in large part, what happened. And women who didn't uh, who weren't working, also their rates of home cooking fell as well. So that's kind of how we got where we still are. They've gotten more and more clever. Processing, when we talk about processed food, there really are you know, two orders of processed food. I think it's important to distinguish. There is what uh, is sometimes called hyper-processed or, or um, ultra-processed food. And then there's first order processed food, which is, you know, Unobjectionable. I mean, freezing vegetables, um, you know, it was a terrific product. Canning tomatoes, uh, milling flour. All these things, although we can talk about white flour, um, all these things, uh, that's what processed food was until the last couple decades when processing reached new heights of, uh, of complexity and the ability to make whole ready meals uh, in, in great amounts. And I have to stress the problem again with this kind of cooking is that um, the kinds of ingredients, the salt, fat, and sugar, key. Also, lots of food additives. Um, as soon as you're cooking food en masse to have such a long shelf life, you need a lot of chemicals to keep it looking as though it were cooked more recently and closer by than it really was. So you have this whole range of chemicals, which Actually, even though we've been lulled into thinking they're all right, there are serious questions about these dyes and these uh, flavorings. And as we're learning about the gut microbiome and the importance of this interior fermentation in our large intestine to our health, we're, there's starting to be very important questions raised about some of those food additives and what they do to the bacteria that we depend on. And then the last point about corporate cooking that's important to understand is they cook different stuff than you do at home. In general, they don't cook that well, um, but things like chips, they cook incredibly well. And here's a classic food that if you make it yourself, um, you have to wash the potatoes, you have to peel the potatoes, you have to slice the potatoes, you have to fry them in a lot of oil, you have to spatter your entire stovetop, you have to clean up, and then you have this pot of oil you have to get rid of. I mean, it's really difficult, and it's a pain. They're wonderful, but it's a pain. And if you make them yourself, you'll only eat them every six weeks, two months, because it's too much work. But when you let corporations cook for you, it's so simple and so inexpensive, and they're really good, that you will have them twice a day, as many people in America do. Um, so you see the kinds of foods you end up with are these labor-intensive foods and desserts. These special occasion foods become everyday foods when we let industry cook for us. In the course of my research, I, I spent a lot of time with a food marketing consultant called Harry Balzer. And he is a man, wonderful name, isn't it? He's, he's a man who has been studying our consumer habits for uh, his whole career. He works for a market research firm in Chicago called NPD. They're kind of the Nielsen ratings of food. And he's, in effect, been, in his own way, working to dismantle the culture of home cooking, about which he sees no future at all. He thinks that cooking in another generation will be regarded as quaintly as quilt making is in ours.
Um, and he has a very, like most people who study marketing, has a pretty cynical view of human nature. He really thinks that we're just too cheap and too lazy, and if corporations can do this, we will let them do it. And, but he fully understands the cost of going down this path. And we talked a lot about, well, what about the obesity epidemic? And what about type 2 diabetes? And this is a man, you know, this is, I'm talking to a voice who's in the belly of the big food beast. And he said, you want to know the diet for America, the one diet that would work? And I'm like, yeah, I take out my pad and I start making notes. He says, eat anything you want, just cook it yourself. And you know, there's a, there's a real wisdom in that. Um, there really is. Uh, it, it, it can solve a multitude of problems. It causes some problems, too. It's, it, and, and we can talk about time and, and all the impediments to cooking. Um, but it solves. It solves the big problem. What would be your view generally on government intervention? I know in, um, in sort of food standards and things like that, I know, say, for example, Mayor Bloomberg's effort in the US to ban large drinks. Do you think there's a happy medium there where something can be worked out? Or do you think the food industry is always going to get around it? The role it's of not the state. Minute? The role of the state, yes, yeah. Exactly. Well, I, you know, it's funny. I've been asked that in the last day because there's also this new uh, proposal in Manchester, I guess, to, um, to, to force chip shops to close during school hours if they're near schools. And, and my reaction to all of these proposals is this. We have a public health crisis around food. It threatens to bankrupt us uh, as a society rates of obesity, rates of type 2 diabetes, heart disease. You know, in America, 75% of healthcare spending is on preventable chronic diseases, most of which are linked to diet, okay? This is a big problem. The reason Mayor Bloomberg got so engaged on the question of soda was that when he took office, he looked at the books, and he saw that the biggest um, crisis, bu budgetary crisis, was in the public hospital system in New York. And someone, and he said, well, how can we get a control of these costs? And someone said, well, for every new case of type 2 diabetes that's diagnosed in New York, it costs your government $425,000 over the life of that child. Um, so if you can reduce type 2 diabetes, you can, you can solve this problem. And he says, how do you do that? And he said, well, the simplest way is reduce soda consumption. And he went about it, trying to tax soda, trying to regulate the, the portion size. And he got lambasted for it. But changing the portion size of soda, and the idea was you, could, uh, you couldn't sell it in 32 ounce uh, containers anymore. I know, 32 ounce containers. It had to be 16 ounces. But you could get a second or a third, all you wanted. But you just would have that, you'd pause for a second and think, am I really thirsty? Do I really want more? This is not radical social engineering. This is what the behavioral economics call a nudge, right? A little change in the environment that may produce big changes in behavior. The fact is, we recoil at social engineering by the government, but for some reason we accept it by industry. Mm -hmm. Social engineering is going on every time you walk into the supermarket. The fact that the sweetened cereals are at eye level and the plain unreconstructed oatmeal is down by your feet is social engineering. And we're not offended by that. Yet we're offended as soon as the mayor says, you know, 16 ounce cups. So my take is we should be equally offended. If we're going to be offended by social engineering, let's look at how corporations are doing. But in the meantime, let's try these experiments and see if they help us solve this problem. My question for you is simply this. How far can you take the metaphor of food? You say that, you know, it's a great way of learning about the world. How can we use that? What's the next stage on? In well, one minute. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a book. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I got interested in when I was doing this was, as I alluded to, is uh, fermentation and bacteria. Hmm. And, and as I delved into our relationship to bacteria, which food brings you into, fermentation especially, it completely revolutionized my understanding of, of human identity. Um, you know you're only 10% human? You're 90% microbes. You're a superorganism. The first person plural needs to be adopted by all of us. Um, and it's not trivial because, because as scientists, uh, there's a scientist I quote in the piece who says, mm -hmm. we need to understand health as a collective property of the human-associated microbiota. So 
food can take us places we haven't gone yet. Mm -hmm. And an understanding of our, and talk about our implication in the world, this is telling you the environment is not just out there, it's passing through you and is part of you. And you have a wilderness here as well as one out there. So I don't think we're done in uh, coming to terms with um, how food connects us to the world.